that, that you can look out for. When you start laying in things like where the horns are, the horns actually flow into sort of the structure of the frill. It's really kind of elegant the way they do it. It's, uh, you know, again, talking about old cars, it's almost the way uh, a fin flows out of a quarter panel on an old 57 Chevy or something like that, an old Cadillac. So it's really neat. You kind of got this nice rounded surface and then this ridge forms and, and terminates as a horn. Uh, it's a really pretty structure. And it also will help us get that three dimensionality and the direction of the head. So what I'm trying for on this guy, because I wanted to get a lot of um, motion and three dimensionality out of it, is really um, trying to take these two horns and get them so that they're, they're really showing us the way the head is, is turned very quickly. The problem with that is, <laughs> I'm like rock on guys, uh, but the neat thing is, if you, if you sort of put your hand in the same position, even if your fingers were the, the same size and the same shape, you're going to see sort of a difference because of that sort of three quarter view. You're gonna get uh, sort of more of the underside of this one than more of the side of this one. So that's what I'm trying to show in here. One of the ways that you can do that is by sneaking in condor, con, uh, contour lines. Not to be confused with condor lines, which are completely different, and fly away. So here, which is a great sort of anchor spot, here is where the eye is. Now this is a really important spot. Um, for Jason, Jason always talks about it, it doesn't seem like an actual animal until the second I put the eye in. And I know this about him. So sometimes I wait till the very end just to mess with him. He doesn't know that, but now he does. So um, I'm going to wait for a little while to put the eye in for that little shine magic. Uh, there's a couple of lines that are really important on the skull itself. You have the brow, which sort of sits like a saddle. So you have a rounded stout like this. And then you have a brow that sort of sits across it coming up this way. So you kind of have a, a U shape with a line across the top, and then you have the horns growing out of it. So there's a lot of shapes here. This is what I was talking about, having all these circles and all these shapes that sort of are almost competing with each other for the angles that they want to show. <coughs> I'm going to eventually put in a little bit of character to this guy, make it look like he's been around for a while. Now, <clears throat> there are a lot of Ceratopsian dinosaurs. And in fact, in my opinion, and don't send me hate mail, uh, Triceratops is kind of boring compared to some of the headgear on other Ceratopsians. I love Triceratops because it's been one of the coolest dinosaurs since I was young when there were only like five of them. Um, but uh, Chasmoceratops, Diabloceratops, all these guys that are actually more closely related to Chasmosaurus or Monoclonius, uh, those guys are really wicked cool. But uh, Triceratops is still the original, so I like I like to give uh, props where I can. Well, this is a. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because Gunnar already asked uh, what you think about Taurosaurus. Uh, you think they're the same thing? No. Uh, Taurosaurus, in fact, that's the coolest thing about the Academy of Natural Sciences. They have one of the coolest skulls of Taurosaurus on display. And the reason that it's the coolest skull is because it totally screws Jack Horner's crew's mass. So when uh, you look at the face of this guy, if you remove the frill, uh, you'd say, oh, that's a Triceratops. The second you put the frill on, you go, oh, it's a, it's a Taurosaurus. So this is really, I think, a question of face. You kind of have to throw away this frill. And again, he is stuck on reabsorption of bone uh, in, a, in a really weird way. You go from a very, very, the most thick, uh, full 
frill on any ceratopsian dinosaur and you make it this strutted really thin thing uh, that that's more decorative than useful i suppose uh in in um, it, basically when you when you're looking at torosaurus um there's all there's still a lot there in common because they are parts they're ceratopsian dinosaurs uh but i'm not buying it i have a feeling that a lot of the younger um you know, uh, of the torosaurs that are known are known only from facial bones because the frill is so lightweight, it simply is not found or recognized, uh, maybe not even preserved. So I, I'm not uh, a supporter of that work, drop the mic. Uh, but it's neat because our specimen may uh, really mess with the numbers on their research because it, it may be a female. It's always been thought of as the female morph of the species because the torosaurs that are at Yale have very, very separated horns and a very big frill. Ours has a slightly smaller frill and the horns are, uh, are almost parallel. So there are some structural differences between ours, which is torosaurus lattice, and the torosaurus that are at Yale. So. Anyway, yeah, I, was, I should shut up and draw a little bit, um, but somebody had to, you know, hit the hot button there. So anyway, here we go. I was skeptical because the frill of Taurosaurus had holes and the Triceratops didn't. You're skeptical because you think like a scientist. Congratulations, that's cool. All right, question everything. That's how it works. Um, and yeah, it's a good it's a good place to start. There's a lot more going on there than then I think uh, we could just simply, we, we should not go to something that doesn't exist strongly elsewhere also. So just because you see uh, bone absorption happening in some things like cassowaries, and even that is not super pronounced, uh, you know, it doesn't mean that it's probably the first thing we should be stating is happening in other animals, that we don't have any record for it happening in. So basically what I'm doing is I have to remember that because I've got this line set up already in that three-dimensional three-quarter pose, I've got to also line up the points in the jaw and make sure I don't lose them. Um, if there were anything showing on this side that should be showing on the other side, I need to make sure that I, I remember to capture that. And since I'm drawing an ink, I've got to get it right the first time. I feel like this should have been really, really cool music keyed right then, like dun, dun, dun. cool struggling to keep it correct. Anyway, that's just me. Provide your own music in your head if you need to. I would go to like, you know, the planets, maybe Jupiter, that would be a cool one. Uh, but I don't know. Maybe some Beastie Boys or Rage, you know, do your thing. A lot of times when, I, when I'm doing, when I'm painting or whatever, I really set the mood with whatever music that I'm listening to. Um, I meet a lot of great punk rock stuff in the 80s. Uh, and I find when I listen to punk rock music, I really kind of work much faster and a little bit looser, which is really fun. Uh, I also love movie soundtracks uh, for having in the background. There's a great piece that was uh, done by Peter Gabriel uh, for The Last Temptation of Christ. That's a great piece of music to listen to, especially for dinosaurs, because it's so different than what we're used to listening to, unless you listen to it every day, then it's the same. Are you suggesting that you don't exclusively listen to the Jurassic Park theme song? I listened to Jurassic Park so much when it first came out. Um, yeah, I, I love that. It's such a, like a fun, the problem is that now, like working in the field, when we get close to the site, that's one of the, it's either that or the theme from Indiana Jones, just depending on how ornery I feel. Um, 
So I actually wanted to be Indiana Jones before I wanted to be uh, a paleontologist. Uh, I, I just, I read so much about archaeology as a young kid, and I, I went, screwed up. How are we supposed to figure out why they wanted to do this from a bunch of pottery shards? <laughs> so I mean, dinosaurs make more sense to me. You know, it, so I, that's, and I really love bones. Bones are wicked cool. So. I recommend the music of Benjamin Barwitt. He did the soundtrack in Walking with Dinosaurs. That's a really terrific one. Um, the soundtrack for 300 is really fun if you like a little rock and roll in there. Uh, great use of guitar. Yeah. So you should be getting a pretty good idea of the angle at which the skull is sitting. And I'm glad it's finally uh, that the, the ink is dark enough to come across the screen. This is not my usual computer, so I was a little worried that we wouldn't get a good image. So I'm glad we are. So I'm putting the little points on the side of the head here. And they're, it's, they're kind of fun because they're almost shaped like uh, Carcharodon megalodon teeth. Although they're not. They're not toothy at all. They're just uh, triangular. That one up. Nobody saw cool. that I messed that one up. Cool. Abe was asking why you go straight to ink. Is it just because you're so experienced with this you can get it on the first try? Um, also because it won't show up on the screen if you do it in pencil first? <laughs> that's, that's the biggest thing. I do do it in pencil first where I'll lay out the sort of action and make sure everything fits. But I don't do any details or anything like that until I get into the... Um, into the ink but i don't want to be sitting here in front of you guys doing the sort of uh okay i'm going to put the body in this position and then get halfway through and realize it doesn't fit on the uh, page so i do sort of block things out um and but I, I block things out the same way that i move throughout the piece which is big shapes first little shapes later uh, sometimes I'll get distracted by a thing like something that's really cool, like a nostril or an eyeball or the spot where the ear goes or, you know, that kind of thing. But for the most part, uh, when, I'm, when I'm sketching and I'm not doing something that has to come to a finish, I go right to ink just because I love ink as a, um, it, it's just a great material to work with. Um, it's, it is also one of these things that if you mess up, you kind of have to learn, how do you hide that? How do you change what you've just done? Um, and if I'm just sketching, I love watching people's faces, um, and, and have them try and figure out where it is I'm going with something. I really find that to be fun because they're like, oh, is he drawing at this or this? And it might be that I'm drawing another animal in front of this animal. And they, they go, oh, what's that anatomy, you know? But, um, you know, with pencil, uh, you have this freedom to not think too far ahead. With ink, you don't have that. You, kinda, you really have to kind of think ahead. And sometimes that'll bite you right in the dinosaur. So right now what I'm doing is I'm, I have the shape of the neck coming down here, and I want to give some, some actual three-dimensionality to the neck. But one of the things that I know is that I'm going to have to block in some shadow here. I'm not going to go crazy with the neck because this, depending on which way we have the light coming, this shield could really set part of this dinosaur in just darkness, which is really wicked cool. When you have a, such a large piece of anatomy, like the ears on an elephant or something like that, it changes the feel of the illustration so dramatically depending on where you have the light source coming from. We're gonna do, one of the reasons why I brought that toy was so that we could do a little experimentation that you could do at home as well. And it, it's something that uh, I had a teacher sort of pick on me about when I was in uh, college. I always drew from the same light source because that's what I was comfortable with. 
but he showed me that there's so many things that you can do with dramatic lighting to change the flavor of the illustration um, and the message that they are that the um, that the viewer is getting. And really, at that time, um, art for me was still all about how many of the girls I could impress because that's you know really what I had to offer was a good sense of humor and some drawing ability. Um, so I stuck to the safe stuff, but it was really kind of fun to be pushed out of my safe zone uh, to, to try different lighting techniques, uh, different amounts of light, different severity of light. Is it, you know, like questions about what time of day is it? Is it noon? You know, is, that, uh, is it a nice soft morning light? Um, you know, what's going to tell the story that I'm trying to tell the best? So I'm working in on the legs on, on the Triceratops right now. And I say this because it's very important. Triceratops, there's a debate that won't seem to die. And that's all about elbows out or elbows in. Um, people, you know, are always talking about, oh, it wouldn't be able to walk this way or it wouldn't be able to walk this way. And there are people that say that on either side. Well, we know that Triceratops walked. We have their footprints. And the answer seems to be that their elbows were a little bit turned out. So whether they could walk that way or not, they did. Um, so one of my favorite quotes is, if I could walk that way, I wouldn't need the talcum powder. And I'm sure that's exactly what Triceratops was all about. So just remember, uh, it's not about whether it could or not, it's about whether it did or not. And that's one of the big questions with a lot of dinosaurs. And people get very hung up on, they, they need a definite black or white answer. And that's not how nature works. Well, I, I, um, I like to point out that I know everybody knows what triceratops look like in general, but I'm not sure very many people just appreciate how truly big they were and even just the skull. And even when I go to a museum and see one, I'm still just kind of dumbfounded at how friggin' big they were. When um, we first got the skull of our Triceratops, I got pictures of me, um, you know, doing the, the car model thing. And I, I could basically sit here and my legs were down here and, you know, I'm five foot seven, and there was still more skull than there was of me. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's really impressive. It's not a comfortable place to sit, but it's still pretty wild. Um, lots of people like to put their kids up there for pictures. Uh, I don't work there anymore, so I don't care. Go ahead. But uh, when I used to, they would, I'd have to train people to yell at you. But it's still a pretty cool animal, uh, and the size is amazing. It really is. And I don't know how many times I've seen a full one reconstructed. Um, we don't get many rain out days in the field. Um, but on the rare occasion that we do, we usually go to the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman. And of course, they have a complete one restored there. And then they ha have the whole series of skulls, uh, just skulls, from young juvenile to adult. And first of all, that's an incredible display. And second of all, it just really highlights how incredibly big those things are. It's just, it, you, can't, you can't picture an animal that big until you're standing right in front of it. The Smithsonian has a nice, uh, nice one as well. Um, and I, I love going and looking at the ones that are at, in Montana. Just, I mean, that's basically their bread and butter was Triceratops for a long time. And to finally see them out on display is amazing. And they are huge, absolutely huge. Um, when I was uh, uh, younger, my, my uh, older daughter and I went and uh, got to feed a rhinoceros and an elephant. And um, I had a friend at the Philadelphia Zoo that worked in the pachyderm house. Um, and you look at an elephant and, uh, or a rhino, and, and you go, wow, that's a big animal. But when your daughter is right in front of it and she's in peril, 
That's a huge animal. <laughs> Luckily, she was never in peril. She did take a piece of apple and throw it to the elephant. Uh, and the elephant's name was Petal. It, it landed on the elephant right here and slid down. And Petal looked really perturbed, like you little poo. <laughs> anyway, there, there's a, uh, a really difficult conversation to have with your ex-wife. Sorry, we went to the zoo. <laughs> no, she's not coming back. <laughs> Just kidding, she's fine. So basically what I've got going on now, we got the head, we've got the shoulders, so that's shoulder section in there, and then we have the belly coming out like this. So we're really taking that sort of three-dimensional head, shoulder, maybe see a little bit of belly there, especially since we're slightly turned. And now what I want to do to, to finish this beautiful sort of, if you were looking down from above, there'd be this really pretty sort of reptilian S curve going on. So I want to continue that with the tail. One of the things that I, that I try and do when you're doing a tail or doing a neck and you've got other things in front is you really have to sort of draw through the shapes. So with this neck, you know, I've drawn the neck, but you probably notice that occasionally I'll do this. And what I'm really doing is I'm trying to see, okay, is the base of the neck the right shape so that it affects this space the way I think it would. The shoulders should be fairly rectangular in sort of looking forward, and then you get this belly. So just sort of like drawing it out with your finger or even a light pencil line. Some people like to do the whole thing in a light blue marker first, and then take the lines that you like and come back and pull them out with your uh, black pen or whatever color you're using uh, to finish it. If you're gonna go full color or whatever, you wanna work up slowly. It's just like the shapes. Start out with your lighter colors and sort of work them up. And don't go black until the very, very end when you can see where your shadows need to be the darkest and your uh, lighter colors need to stay nice and light. Once you go to that, uh, getting to, to the darkest colors, it's really hard to sort of fight them back to get them into grays or whatever. So make sure that's sort of the last thing. That's really what will make your picture pop. So I'm adding a couple of lines into, into uh, different surfaces to sort of just get some texture in there, but also a little bit of the, the roundness to, uh, to these things. I also want to make sure that I, I get, like I said, I wanted to put some personality in this guy. Make sure that um, that he felt like he's sort of a, it's more, we're more in the Star Wars universe here, where it's a lived-in universe. Let's track more Star Wars, uh, for dinosaurs at least. So um, one of the fun things about Ceratopsy and dinosaurs is there's an awful lot of evidence for um, coming together at least pushing each other around with the horns. Um, so males trying to establish who's, who's the boss or whatever, who gets mating rights or whatever. The interesting thing is like a football player like you or whatever, when you're running and you trip, you tend to turn to your dominant side. If somebody's gonna hit you, you turn to your dominant side. Um, so when animals that lock in the horn combat or antler combat, it's the same thing. They have a dominant side. The side that is more dominant is where they're gonna wear a lot more of their battle scars. It's very interesting. Um, so uh, for this guy, we're, we're gonna say, you know, his left hand side is showing. So he's taking a lot of damage on that side uh, because he's fighting a lot of right-handers. You know, probably, uh, uh, whatever, something like that. Uh, we'll sort of bend the rules a little bit if we have to, just to get into some cool scarring. 
So, uh, Jason, this is your moment. I'm going to put in the eyeball. So, um, talk a lot about the kinds of eyes that dinosaurs have. And it's very hard to know. When we look at birds, birds run the gamut of, of uh, different types of eyes. Crocodilians have really, really cool eyes. Uh, these guys were just kind of hanging out and, you know, doing their thing, grazing. And I just, I like to work in a little bit of that. I can imply that behavior almost by giving it a, a, an eye like a lot of the grazing animals that are around today. Unfortunately, most of them are animals that are mammals. But when you look at um, animals like uh, green iguanas and things like that, their eyes aren't much different. They're nice, big, round. Um, they do have a discernible pupil, and then the iris is a, is a slightly more uh, green to brown color. So in my guy, I'm going to do it a little bit more like a cow, just because I want the eye to stick out. But I, I so having a nice dark surface for the entire eye gives it a more discernible shape from a distance. Uh, for a dinosaur, the eye should be fairly large uh, on Triceratops. They also have a very large set of the, part of their brain set aside for uh, visual acuity, for being able to see things, possibly even color. Um, when you have a nice big advertising area here, patterns in color make a lot of sense for you to be able to read or see. Uh, so it's thought that that larger area for the uh, use of information that's coming to you through your eyes uh, may have been just that, uh, being able to sense what's going on here, see what's going on there. But also if they're eating plant materials, color vision is very helpful in discerning whether or not what you're eating is right. So there's a couple of really good arguments for these guys being able to see pretty well and also possibly in color. They're just arguments though, we don't really know. All right, so now's our chance to kind of really figure out where the lighting is gonna come from. If I do the lighting from here, we see this nice bright frill and it, it's set off by darker shadows underneath. Depending on how much we go, we're gonna get sort of the shadow in around here. And I think that's really cool. That's probably what we're gonna do because it's gonna make this head really pop. And that's where most of the information, most of the fun stuff for this drawing uh, is. I still want to add in a couple of really cool scars. One right there. Hey, Paul, uh, Gunnar is asking an interesting question. Do you think they traveled in herds? Uh, what, do you think they defend their young? <clears throat> there is some evidence for possibly uh, uh, seasonality, so traveling together during certain seasons. Uh, interestingly, though, these guys uh, tend to be found by themselves, where other ceratopsian dinosaurs are found together in herds. So triceratops may have been herding uh, during times of year where fossilization uh, it's in you know, the beginning processes, their, their bones, if they died during that time, were not getting preserved. Uh, you know, they could have been moving from place to place during the dry season, and then we'll, you know, not, maybe not get them, or, I, you know, I don't know. But most of the time, they're found uh, by themselves. How about defense of their young? Defense of their young is something that um, in numbers is very different. If it's just a mother and a couple of young, the defense is going to be very different um, than animals that move around in herds, obviously. Um, 
So again, that's going to be tied to that. And I think one of the things that would draw them together would be, you know, parenting, uh, because that, that seems to work with birds. It also seems to work pretty well with crocodilians. So, <clears throat> so I don't know. I think seasonally, maybe just after the eggs are, uh, or the, the young are mobile, uh, after hatching, uh, and I, I don't know how long that would be for Triceratops. I don't know how long the the young would be nest bound. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of Triceratops nests, which is another problem. <clears throat> we do have some of their relatives' nests, but we don't have Triceratops. So what I'm doing right now is just sort of adding in where I think that shadow would fall from the frill on the actual neck and shoulders. And I'm adding that in. Um, sometimes it's really fun to block that part in with a really big fat black magic marker, uh, which I did not bring. So I'm gonna keep cross hatching really quick, as fast as I can without scribbling. Now I tend to think about each shape that's going on here, sort of not all at once. I uh, try and sort of take them apart and go, okay, this is gonna react down here with light this way. But then I'm gonna come back and say, okay, if this is bright, then this can't be. So I'm going to add in a layer of shadow in that and just play right into the one that I drew before. That's kind of one of the nice things about pencil and ink. Uh, you can do it in paint too, but uh, sometimes it doesn't look as realistic as it should. So usually if you're going to paint, you want to have all of those questions answered as much as you can ahead of time, but you, you still have some play when you get back if you haven't quite got it right, you can, you can work back into it. And with the light coming down, I think we're gonna see some pretty sharp shadowing underneath here. And again, uh, because I grew up with comic books, shading for me is always sort of a cross hatching kind of line art trick, trick it, uh, to the eye. And I say trick to the eye because I, I probably harped on this before, but I think it's one of the coolest things about black and white illustration. And sadly, you're not seeing as much black and, and white illustration as you used to because printing in color has really become the big thing. Where you used to be able to sell a lot of black and white uh, illustrations, you can see an artist working in black and white and in color and really see how their sort of mind works for shape when you compare the two. Uh, Frank Frazetta is, is one of those artists. A lot of the comic book guys uh, are still like that, which is great. Uh, cool. I was just, um, I just posted a link to your website, and I remembered as I was doing it that not that long ago you said you'd be adding some more images to it. Um, getting around to that yet? No, so my uh, web designer had been away for a little while. Okay. So she, he's, he's back now um, and went, holy cow, you've got a lot. <laughs> so uh, we may actually be taking pictures. A lot of the pictures I have are from my phone and they just don't do the, the paintings justice. So we're, we're going to figure out if we're just going to throw them up there uh, for now as a placeholder and then put the nice photos of them up. Uh, but I'm hoping to get that done in the next couple of weeks. Because I think I said that I would have it done a couple of weeks ago. So we're right about on, on schedule. <laughs> it's really funny. I love doing the art. I love doing these classes. But I really need somebody. I don't know if I would call them a manager. More like a handler. Like somebody that will, will put me in a chair and say, draw, idiot, draw. You know, <laughs> I thought that's what Stacy does. Okay, I didn't want to uh, name names, but that's really what <laughs> Stacy does. Yeah. The funny thing is, we were just talking about 
this and she's like well why don't why don't we do um you know lessons from the house and more lessons on the internet you know and obviously not now we can't with covid running around and doing this thing we have to wait till after that but uh, eventually, you know, that, that's one of those things that I definitely want to do. Uh, but I don't want to deal with like scheduling uh, and all that stuff because I'm not good at it. And uh, she said, well, you know, your wife is obsessive compulsive. So this, this will happen. So basically now figured out where the light is coming from. How are we on time? We have about 15 minutes left or so. Yeah, we're really doing well. Cool. Good. I'm just adding in a little bit to the frill. Sort of almost texture, texturally. Um, Still thinking about how that light is hitting. I really like how dark it is here. The stuff that's closest up to you, up to you will have the most contrast. <laughs> so I didn't go crazy with the detail along the edge of the frill here because I really wanted that to stand out against the black. But the nice thing is I can come back now and really make it pop by making sure I don't have any white spaces right next to uh, the edges. Now back here, I want it to sort of start to fade back because that's getting closer to a zone where the light is going to hit it. But up here, it's going to stay nice and dark. I'm going to add in a couple of uh, these kinds of things. And I want to darken this line down here. When you start uh, really getting into playing around with line weight, then you're really getting an idea of how to make your pictures do what I talk about a lot, which is pop. You really want these things to feel like they're dynamic. So getting them to pop is all about understanding where it should be brightest, where it, uh, you know you have opportunities for little lighter spaces uh, that'll act as highlights. Uh, I think because the light's coming down this way, we're gonna catch some shadow right in here. That looks right to me. I'm gonna carry that. That's coming down this way. I'm gonna see a little bit of that right there. Now this is really fun. If I um, was doing this for a book or something like that, or for publication, I would want to open up some reference, a couple of different pieces of reference. Uh, and I'd want to do things like toe counts. How many toes are on the back feet? How many toes are on the front feet? Uh, how many of those would actually have terminal phalanx or claws? Uh, which in this case would look a little more like triangular hoofs or hooves. Um, whichever behooves you. <laughs> sorry, I, I'm sorry. Um, so this is a great step. Like this is kind of where I take artwork uh, and, and we're talking about things and say a session to try and figure out, you know, what a magazine uh, illustration should look like or what I want to do with a painting. And I'll take this and this will really help me work out sort of the dynamic pose and the shadows that should also help to make that more dynamic. Well, I would assume that uh, if you wanted to, you could really take some artistic liberties with 
um, the frill or the shield. Um, you know, there's lots of speculation about how brightly they may be colored or what patterns are there, that kind of stuff. So especially if you were coloring it in, I assume you could just pretty much go crazy with that section, huh? Yeah, I think so. I, it's funny. Um, these guys have, I mean, there, there's, there's so much tank like, you know, there, the whole idea of them just sort of pushing against each other, being so massive and large uh, and gray and, or olive green or whatever, or patches of color. I think, though, that frill has to have, uh, you know, pattern and color on it that we would find kind of astonishing. Uh, you know, I, I even kind of, when they eat, this is, and this is totally off the cuff. This is something I've just kind of popped into my mind uh, a while back. When they're eating, their head is down. So their frill is up. And okay, we're thinking about the frill being up. But really interestingly, the back of the frill is up. What if the back of the frill did something that so many other animals that needed to scare away predators did? What if there were big eye shapes on the back of the frill? You know, that would be so cool. Uh, you that reminds me, I've, I've heard uh, several times, and I just saw this story again recently, that if you paint eye-shaped things on the butts of cows, like in Africa and India, they get eaten a lot less. Yeah. Yeah, it confuses things like crocodiles and large cats, mostly. So bizarre. And the cow, like, why are you painting eyes on my butt? Well, I think they like it. <laughs> You know, it's like having your nails done. You, you're like, I'm going to go have some eyeballs painted on my butt. So, who knows? It's a trend. Um, I really like, it's really funny. I like a lot of the patterns that uh, a lot of the guys came up with for World War II um, fighter planes and stuff like that. And there's a lot of this sort of jagged edge stuff going on here. Uh, and I'd, I'd love to sort of take something like naturalistic, but also a little bit hearkening to that, um, you know, and, and sort of carry it, carry it forward. So, you know, these kinds of shapes would be really fun to just have on the I triceratops. Once, I once saw a picture on DeviantArt. I think it's supposed to be a chasmosaurus. They gave it a furrow pattern that mimics the face of a tyrannosaur. <laughs> it had like the little spots representing the eyes and the teeth. It's like those butterflies that have like those eyes on their wings. Yeah, yeah, the uh, ally butterflies, that's really cool. Uh, but you're right, Poole, your point about how it's always kind of up when their head's down eating, I mean, it's, it's basically a big billboard it could, that could, um, display any kind of message it really wanted to. So yeah, I mean, it, it could be anything. I think for me, you know, party in the front <laughs> and then, you know, anti-predators in the back. So Devin, we clearly need to have more of these because if we skip a month, he has time to come up with just all way too many of these kinds of jokes. So. <laughs> oh no, party in the front, predator in the back is quite a tagline. <laughs> I think we should just change all of our marketing now. <laughs> yes. Pretty logo. So here, just with some black and white again, hinting at more texture, uh, that kind of fun. It might, it might be really fun. I think somebody may have beaten me to this recently, but I, I was just looking at this going, it needs like a big cow like splotch over the eye, like one of the big spots from like the Guernsey cows or something, you know. But I, I like this. It's uh, it's simple. It's cool. Um, if I was to take this further, I would really play around with some of the newer thinking about Triceratops is that the whole front of the face is really from about here forward uh, and all across the horns of the frill is really heavily almost like enameled. So it's covered in the same kind of stuff as your fingernails. Uh, so that would actually be fairly shiny. And with the light coming from where it's coming, the highlights could really be blingy and kind of fun. Uh, so, I mean, I, you could really get into that. That would be a lot more fun to play up with, um, with acrylic paints or something like that. 
Um, but they're also talking about uh, a lot of the filament-like structures that are coming off of the back. We're talking a lot more about the sort of more octagonal shape to a lot of the scales on the back. So Triceratops, because it's been around for so long, we really uh, have gotten to, to know a lot um, about it compared to some of the other dinosaurs. Um, and sometimes that's made things easier and sometimes it just made things more of a, a mess. Like, we, well, if this, why, you know, how did that get there? You know, so um, Triceratops is a really fun dinosaur to look at uh, because it also challenges some of our preconceived notions about that whole family tree, which is fun. And I, I love the, the idea of the horns and the frill as part of this sort of biologic arms race, very specifically between Tyrannosaurus and Ceratopsians, which is very fun. Which size surely is a part of, right? I mean, we've talked about how big Triceratops was. It's not coincidence, I'm sure, that the largest predators ever, uh, land predators ever, were at the same time. Not to mention, I mean, you've got this big, uh, the this, this size increasing. So you see the, the birth uh, of both of these groups in the same place, um, you know, in China and Mongolia, and you see that, that lineage evolve as they sort of move throughout uh, and end up in North America. Um, and it's very interesting to see the size ratios of both stay very close. Uh, and then to also see that, that the prey is developing these massive structures over the neck and the predator is developing bone crushing teeth. So there's a story there and it's a beautiful one. You know, it's a, I mean, not beautiful as in, uh, uh, wow, look at the blood, how pretty, uh, but beautiful as in the cause and effect and the pressures of evolution doing some really wicked cool stuff that you can actually relate to because we've sampled enough to start to tell those stories. Definitely. I hope somebody recorded that. <laughs> well, the whole thing's being recorded. Oh no. <laughs> Terrible uh, jokes and all. Uh oh. That's gonna come back to haunt me. So anyway, I like this guy. Um, I think it's really good here. Like I would stop if I go too far. This is one of the hardest things about drawing and sketching is you can go too far. Uh, the one thing that I would add in, and it's just sort of one of the things that I love to add in are clouds. So it just gives it sort of space where it's supposed to be. Well, Paul, give me an example of what would going too far with the dinosaur look like? Like what specifically would you do oh, if you were going too far? If I worked too, too much with the cross hatching, you can actually lose details that are really fun. Uh, if I if I worked in here too much, I might get a really nice curvature to this cheek, say, but I may lose a lot of this down here. So you're kind of forced to follow through on things that here, you can just let your head fill in and you can let the viewer's head fill in. Um, the, the, I think the problem is sometimes you can, uh, you can underestimate the viewer's eye uh, or overestimate your own ability. And um, if I'm going for something that's supposed to take an hour to produce, I want to sort of stay on the side of uh, sort of suggesting a lot of things, but letting your mind fill them in because that's it's fun. Um, I'm not going to do individual scales. If I did individual scales on this, it would look like a muddy mess. Uh, I would have to switch up to a different pen and do them super light and small, then it might work. But if we're staying with the same line weight, you know, I don't want to mess with it too much. Well, uh, well um, one last question before we call it a night, but on a similar line here, Gunnar was just asking, how do you feel about quills or uh, tail quills or feathers like on Cetacosaurus? Well, that's one of the things that I was, I was talking about. Um, the quills seem to be a thing. They, they seem to, 
be scientifically representing, you know, the, the, the fossils are representing these structures. Uh, we know that they're a hollow, <coughs> but only slightly. Um, so, uh, and that they're based like a quill, not based like a spine that an iguana might have, where, where it's basically a scale that's grown over. Uh, it's actually a quill that's seated in the skin. So there's a difference, and that's pretty neat. The iguanas can't really do a whole lot with all those little bits that stick out. They can, they can when they get alert, they can kind of stand up a little bit weird, like different. Uh, but the, the quills can lay down, stand up, and it's all just due to the twitch of the skin. So it's, it's basically the top of the skin reacting uh, slightly more tightly than the subdermal underneath the skin. So you're actually able to turn them a little bit. Um, so I think that that's a, that's a probable um, a probable definite. I guess you put it that way. But uh, how far it's actually gotten into the rest of the ceratopsians, I don't know. Um, it's interesting. I uh, there's been a lot of reconstructions where they've put them on the triceratops, especially in the hind quarters. Um, they almost look like porcupine quills. I think that's too far. We have to remember that these animals were huge. So if you find a filament this long on a huge animal, it's going to look really tiny. So well, and that affects your illustrations too. Like again, the same reason you don't wouldn't put scales similar to feathers. I mean, obviously the feathers would be bigger, but um, it, it would be hard to. Well, and that's the other thing is if he had feathers, again, they'd probably be like contour feathers, you know, so they're, they're going to contour the body. You would probably not really notice them that much until you get close. Sure. Cool. Well, all right, yeah. man, that's a perfect way to end and a perfect time to end. It's nine o'clock on the dot. You're getting really good at this. <laughs> it's fun. I really enjoy it. These are great nights. I'm really glad people are enjoying them. If you're not enjoying them, say, hey, I'd like to see more of this and let, let me know. Uh, send me an email. Uh, we'd love to sort of grow these things. Don't tell me which animals you want. Tell Jason Shine. <laughs> yes, feel free to tell us at any time. Um, we've got uh, Velociraptors next month, and then the next month, uh, Devin, remind me, is that Ankylosaurus already? No, October is Therizinosaurus. Mm -hmm, yeah. And... November is ankylosaurs. I don't think we've decided on exactly which one yet or not. Uh, but all of these things are on the website that I mentioned that I posted earlier on our events at home page. And uh, so you can check all those out there. You have something, Jason? Yeah, why don't we do the ankylosaur that's come up from um, Canada real recently, the one that has all the um, almost mummified properties. Uh, because I think people ahead of time can pull up some cool reference uh, sure. for that. And then I, you know, I'll do the same thing. And um, I think that'd be really fun. Sure. Cool. Um, I don't know if we specified, if we had gone so far to specify yet, Devin, or not. But sure, we can definitely talk about that. That'd be cool. Um, yeah, I don't think so. Okay. Cool. Um, just one more thing I would love to remind everybody to please donate to the fun run. Um, Jason just put the, the link in the chat. Uh, it's a really cool time. They're offering a match on all donations. So they go way further than we usually have the capability. So it's really awesome. And you're not required to run. We're not doing that to anybody. We're not doing that to ourselves. <laughs> so, um, but we would just, you know, we'd love your support. And for, there are some people who have registered to run, which is amazing, um, you know, on our behalf. And so if you wanna just tag us in stuff on social media and we will share it to help support these people, it's on September 5th. So, uh, you know, we'll send out a reminder again, but we're really excited about that. Um, and one last thing before we go, because I always almost forget to do this, um, could everybody please hold up their drawing so we can see? Yeah. Yes. Come on, everybody. <laughs> Anna. Nice. That's cool. Those are awesome, guys. Love it. Yeah. Oh my gosh, those are amazing. Yeah, see that rocks. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
Dang. Well, I won't be doing this again, but from now on, I'm just watching. <laughs> um, but that's all for me. Yeah, Sorry thank you guys, time. as always, so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Abe, that's amazing. Thank cool. you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Wow. Thank you, guys. Take care. We'll see you soon. Awesome. Bye. Bye-bye. Catching flowers would be fun to draw, too.